So on Friday, uh, an email went out to everybody that's a member, a regular attender in, here in our church, and it's uh, announcing that we're now in a season where we're electing new elders. And so uh, if you didn't get that, I'll say more about how to make sure you do get that at the end of the service. But we wanted to take uh, a break from Mark this morning to think together about elders, about what an elder is and what they do, especially as we all have the opportunity right now for the next couple of weeks to uh, nominate and elect new elders. So it's important that we take, take a Sunday to look at this together. So we break from Mark today to look at one of the famous little sections about eldership, which is in 1 Peter 5. And I want to look at two things this morning with you. First, uh, the fact of elder, that there is such a thing. And then secondly, at the revolutionary call that Peter gives here to the eldership, how Christ changes what it means to be a leader. So let's, let's do that together. First, uh, the fact of elder. All right, so verse 1, Peter says, uh, I exhort the elders among you. And if you look at chapter 1, Peter says that he's writing this letter to people in Pontus, Asia, Cappadocia, Galatia, Bithynia, a lot of places that covers a lot of territory, uh, mostly what we would see today as Turkey. And that means Peter's talking to a ton of churches, not just one. This is a circular letter. And the very first thing he does is when he gets to chapter 5, he assumes that there are elders in every one of these churches. So he says, I t- I'm talking to the elders among you, meaning hundreds of churches that have been planted across Asia at this point. I'm talking to all the elders, meaning that everywhere the apostles went, Peter knows they did the same thing every time. They uh, chose elders. And that means that he's saying, this is the model. This is the model that the apostles carried forth into the world. And he says, I'm even one of these elders. He says, I'm both an apostle and an elder. So he's saying, I witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm an apostle. But he knew that the apostles were not going to last forever. That there would come a day, 30, 40, 50 years from this moment, where the apostles would be gone. And so his expectation is that the churches will be governed and led by elders. And that was the norm all across uh, the apostolic witness in the, in the first century. Um, the word here for elder is the word presbyter in Greek. And so it's where we get our word Presbyterian. So we talk about a Presbyterian form of church government, which is what we have, which is just basically ruled by elders. And we see here that the model from the very beginning was to be Presbyterian. And if you flip over to Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, it says that when John's looking into heaven, he sees this vision. Jesus is there, and around Jesus there's a council, 24 seats with 24 elders. And that means in the Bible we see that the church is Presbyterian and that heaven's Presbyterian. And that that's the model in, in both places, that we just model after the picture that we see in heaven. And let me, let me give you two takeaways why this is important. One is this, simply to say, again, uh, what we're doing when we, when we elect and nominate new elders is that we're simply trying to be biblical, actually. We're just trying to follow the model of Scripture, the model that God's given us. And you can see this when you, if you flip through the Old Testament and the New Testament and look for the concept of elder. You can go all the way back to Deuteronomy 21 and 22, where any time you have God's people being established as a community, God says, use elders. And so Moses designated elders in Deuteronomy 21 and 22. Or later, King David had a council of elders that helped him rule the people of God in the Old Testament. Or even after that, in the first century, every single Jewish village was ruled, run by elders. Every single synagogue before Jesus came was run and ruled by elders. Uh, You get to about 10 years after probably the last apostle's death, John, the very earliest piece of writing we have, uh, extra biblical writing, Christian piece of writing, is a letter from a guy named First, from Clement. First Clement's the letter. And in it, Clement talks about how in, across the, the Roman Empire, the apostles went appointing approved men, elders, with the consent of the church. And so all the way from the Old Testament all the way through the first century after the apostles die and through the book of Acts and everywhere else, we see this happening over and over and over and over again. And we see very clearly that this is the model that God's given us. Now, the second takeaway is this. It's so important to to say that this is the model, the biblical model, because lots of people have abandoned the idea of eldership and even of the institutional church altogether 
in recent years, especially as of late. Um, one soci- there's a sociologist in the States named Ryan Burge. Uh, he's also a pastor, and he's done a lot of work uh, trying to gather data on people leaving the church, leaving the church in droves, both in the UK and Europe uh, uh, earlier, and then also currently the US. And one of the things that he says over and over again is <clears throat> one of the pe- pe- reasons people are leaving churches is because of a high level of institutional suspicion that people are incredibly suspicious in the 21st century of institutions. And that's the church, that's the business, that's banks, that's everything. People are institutionally suspicious. And one of the reasons for that is because we're individuals, we're individualists. And so when you prize the individual over the community, over the collective as we do, and then you take the very good reason for leaving, which is so much institutional corruption, and you put those together and people are flocking, running away from the, from the old systems, the old flocks. And the, there's good reason for that because you can turn on religious news all the time and see that in the church, just like in the culture at large, you always see people abdicating leadership through great moral error or abusing their power. And we have a new phrase to coin for this. It's called spiritual abuse, and it's very real. It happens all the time. And so people often are leaving the church and abandoning the eldership model, the leadership model, because they say it corrupts. Power corrupts. Now, the important thing to see here is to come today and say it's always been that way. This is nothing new. And at the same time, the Bible says, nevertheless, this is the model. Be biblical. And so Peter's giving an incredible revolutionary call here that says the way we deal with this problem is by rethinking what an elder is, which is exactly what he's doing uh, in this passage. We have... um, a text from a pastor in the 4th century named John Chrysostom. And he talks about this problem. In the late 300s, he says uh, he, he had a view of priests and bishops a little different from us. But this is what he says. He says, The priests are all infected with greed. They're power hungry. They don't care for anybody. And I don't think the many bishops will ever be saved. He says, I don't think I'll see too many of the bishops in heaven. All right, so we say this is such a problem in the 21st century, but it's always because we're talking about humans. And so whether you're in the church or outside of the church, we tend to abuse institutional power. And that's exactly actually what Peter's coming to deal with right here. Peter says, revolutionary call. On the one hand, don't abdicate the office. Don't, don't give up on the model because this is the model God's given. And at the other hand, on the other hand, he says to the elders, to you elders and you candidates, listen to the revolutionary call that I'm about to give you. Now, let me summarize it for you in just one, one word before we dig into it a little more. If you look at Paul's list for eldership, 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, he gives you these lists of characteristics. What do you, what do you have to be to qualify? How should an elder live? And here's some of the ones he, he lists in both places. He says, above reproach, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, not a drunkard, not violent, gentle, not quarrelsome, not addicted to money, well thought of by non-Christians. Only one category, one qualifying qualification that Paul gives has to do with talent or gift. Only one. And it's the ability to teach or the ability to communicate the apostles' teaching to other people. At a 12 to 1 ratio, overwhelmingly, all that he talks about is character. He says, you know, you need to be able to teach God's word to some degree, but the big thing is character. Character, character. Twelve times he says it versus the one time where he talks about one gift. And that's it. He says eldership is the model. Character is the aspiration. It's what protects the office and keeps it from falling apart. All right? So Peter here is going to give us a revolutionary call to eldership. And let's look at it. Secondly, it, it comes to us in three ways, three ways, three revolution, revolutionary calls, if you will. And the first one is this. He says in verse three that elders are to be examples. And that's revolutionary. Why? You see it in verse three. He says elders are to be not domineering, but instead examples. And uh, the reason it's revolutionary is because He's addressing something very specific, very common in the first century. Um, Leaders often dominated. And the word domineering or to dominate here has the the sense of a master-slave type relationship. So leaders often took up power 
and became master-like in the midst of subordinates, the young, as he puts it in verse 5, and treated them like servants, like, like slaves, in the midst of all kinds of forms of leadership. C.S. Lewis, uh, commenting on this, says, of all the bad men, religious bad men are the worst. And that's exactly actually what, what Peter's saying as well. You, you don't have to leave the Bible to know that because uh, Jesus, Jesus talked about this. He talked about the condition of religious leaders who dominate, who oppress. Uh, and he said in Matthew 23, verse 4, he said, the religious leaders put heavy burdens on the people's shoulders and they won't do the stuff themselves. So he says one, one of the ways is that religious leaders tend to dominate by trying to put burdens on people. In other words, creating new forms of sin and saying that if you don't obey me, if you don't follow me to the letter, then you're not truly following God. So in other words, they create new ideas, new theology, uh, different ways of sinning that aren't actually even in the scriptures, and they use it to lord it over people. In other words, the, the word for dominate here is basically this. Whenever an elder, a leader, a pastor, a minister, a Pharisee, whoever it might be in any religious community says, ultimately, follow me. That's why this is such a revolution. You see, he says, elders aren't called to ever say, follow me. They're called to be examples. And that's the heart of the revolution. See, domineering or domination is when a leader says, do like me, follow me. In other words, do what I say or you're not truly following God. So a dominating elder, a dominating leader takes the focus away from Jesus Christ ultimately and puts it on, him, on themselves. Uh, Jesus uh, says it, that it's not only a problem in, in the church, in the religious community, but he talks about it outside too. He says in Matthew 25, uh, Gentile rulers dominate their people. He says, Gentile rulers lord over their people, but not so with you. And he's talking there to the apostles. He's saying, do not look at the model of the Pharisees. Do not look at the model of the common ruler. He says, that's not it at all in the church. Both tend to dominate their people, but you can't do that. You have to, and then he says, you have to be the servant of all, which in the, the Greek word there is slave. You have to actually be the one that goes low. If you want to seek a high office, you've got to go and become the lowest in the midst of the people. And so he's saying there's no, uh, no, no reward in this life, ultimately. Uh, no power, no prestige. You can see how he puts it in uh, verse 2, part B. He says, uh, don't do it under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, nor for shameful gain, but eagerly. And he's saying there that there's plenty of leaders all around you that are leaders because they want shameful gain. So he's talking about actual first century stuff where an elder of a synagogue, an elder of a city, was paid really handsomely. And they were in charge of building, they owned the properties ultimately, it was given over to them. They were in charge of the educational system. The elders in the synagogue were typically over the hospitals, some type of system of health care. They were in, in charge of things like that. Uh, they had access to the buildings, health care, education, money. They gathered the temple tax. They gathered the synagogue tax. And he's saying, oh boy, that is a hotbed of temptation. And people pursue eldership in that context for shameful gain. So he's, he's addressing something very real and very direct. And <clears throat> he's saying the church can never be like that. Elder can never pursue it because they want power, prestige, or money. And I can promise you that no elder in this church ever pursues eldership for money. That's one thing that we can guarantee. Uh, they don't get paid, and uh, the ministers uh, don't pursue it for money either. You can't. Um, that's not how it works at all. But he's saying, but neither power nor prestige. It can't be, I've been here for 25 years, therefore I should be, it can't, it can't be um, who, biological, bloodline, financial, none of it. He's saying that, that none of that can be the way. And instead he says the eldership is meant for exampling. Now here's how that's such a revolution. Domination says follow me, be like me, and tries to control. Whereas exampling says I am here to help you follow somebody else. The only thing I exist for is not to ever say follow me, but to say follow him. Follow Jesus Christ, and I, and I only come as a model, as a, as a person who stands next to somebody, the elder, I'm saying, and says, let me help you follow Jesus. Don't listen to me. I just want to help you follow Jesus. That's what he's saying. That's the revolution. He's saying to all the leaders in the first century, you're, you only exist to lead people to the green grass, and that's Jesus Christ. That's all you exist for, ultimately. Uh, the implication is this, and we'll move on. 
and this is very important, if the eldership is an office of example, trying to help people see what it means to follow Christ, then that means that the ministry is actually just the same for everybody. You see, if, if an elder is nothing but an example, if leadership is nothing but exampling following Jesus, then that means we're all just called to the same thing, following Jesus. And the elder exists to do nothing else but help people ultimately do that in the end. The, the revolution is that they're not there for power or prestige or money, none of that. It's, it's simply the service of saying, uh, I'll get into the mess with you and walk beside you as you try to follow Christ. We'll just do it together. That's the revolution here. Now, the second revolutionary call of three uh, is not only that the elder is called to be an example, but then he, he tells us more specifically what that looks like. And he says it in verse two that they're meant to be shepherds. So the way they're to example is very specifically to be shepherds. And that's, a, of course, a metaphor, the metaphor that Peter chooses here. He says, shepherd the flock of God, exercising oversight. Now, Scotland is one of the few places where this metaphor works. Uh, if you preach on shepherd, the, the image of the shepherd in most places throughout the entire world in 2023, uh, people can't actually get a good picture of what's being said. But here in, in Scotland, of course, we can, and many of you know shepherding and she, uh, sheep way better than I do. Um, but th- the reason is because you can drive through the highlands and, you know, you can see a flock of sheep that have come out into the road, single track road, and you desperately need them to move. And half the time, what do they do? They, they just sit there. And it's because you realize, it, it, I'm not a shepherd, but I realized very quickly driving through the highlands, sheep are dumb. That's the principal message, actually. Sheep are dumb. And, uh, you know, throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, over and over and over again, the Bible keeps using the image that God is the shepherd and we're the sheep. And this is to put it a little crudely, I admit, but it's really to try to get across the emphasis that we are spiritually dumb. A better way to say it, we're helpless. And, you know, if you're around sheep at all, which I haven't been that much, but a little bit, you realize sheep are incredibly helpless. They're, they're, help, they're, they're so dependent on the shepherd. And so here Peter comes and says, well, that's actually the image, is that God has given shepherds. Now, what he's not saying is that the elders among you are the smart spiritual people and you're the dumb spiritual people. Not at all. Actually, he's saying here, the elders are the first sheep. So in verse four, he says, they, they all understand that they have a chief shepherd. That's what he says in verse four. Meaning every single elder qualifies first by being best above all at knowing how much of a sheep they really are. At being willing to, to sing the hymn, come thou fount of every blessing, and you get to the line, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Meaning, written about sheep, prone to wander away, sheep wander. And that's what the elder sings and says first. They know I'm, I'm a sheep of the chief, chief shepherd, and in that, I'm able to be what many have called an under-shepherd. That's the image we're being given here. Uh, think about who's writing this. Peter knows that he's not spiritually smart. <laughs> he, uh, Peter abandoned Jesus Christ. Peter committed treason against Jesus Christ. He rejected Jesus. He told Jesus that he wouldn't let the plan go forward, and it's Peter writing this. He knows what he's really like, and yet he's a shepherd of the sheep, an under-shepherd. Now, uh, Harold Sinkbile, a, a writer who wrote a book called The, the Care of Souls, about eldership and, and pastoring, he is really helpful because he says that maybe an even uh, more helpful metaphor than un- shepherd and under shepherds, chief shepherd Jesus, under shepherd, is the shepherd Jesus and the sheep dog. Uh, so elders are like sheep dogs, and if you've ever seen a sheep dog operate, you know that um, they do they do two things. They sink bile rights. He says they give their both ears to the master. So whenever they're running around herding and, and corralling the sheep, both ears are attuned to the master, but their eyes are on the sheep. And that's the image of the elder, that their ears are attuned to the master, servants, and their eyes are on the sheep, trying to help the sheep. And one writer, Evelyn Underhill, she wrote a book called The Teacher's Vocation, where she observed sheepdogs in action. And this is what uh, she says about it. The dog was a docile and faithful agent of another's mind. He used his intelligence, but he always did it in obedience to the master's will. 
The little mountain sheep he had to deal with were exceedingly tiresome, experts in going the wrong way. Even so, the dog went steadily on with it. The dog's relation to the shepherd was the center of his life, and because of that, he enjoyed doing his job for the sheep. He was working for something not his, of his own, uh, not, not his own, the whole of which he could understand or grasp, but that was exactly the source of his delight. So she's saying the dog worked for the master tire, tirelessly, not even understanding what was happening. Couldn't even quite, what are we actually doing with these sheep? He didn't even quite understand the big picture, not at all, and yet that was exactly his joy, the dog's joy, just to shepherd the sheep as the will of the master, not knowing the big picture, not knowing how it would go, not knowing what would happen. In other words, he's saying the elder's job, the minister's job, is to tirelessly care for the sheep and not really know the big picture, not really know what's happening. It really is one of the sheep himself. Uh, and, and that gives us such an helpful, a helpful image because it tells you the two classical things people have said century after century about what an elder does. Uh, the sheepdog is, is a great image because the, the elder first, we, we, we've always said this in Christian history, first, the elder's job is to guard and protect. The image of the sheepdog, or the, the shepherd with a staff, to guard and protect. Uh, you can scan your eyes down just quickly at verse 8, and Peter, just a few verses later, says, be sober-minded, be watchful. El- he's talking to the elders, be watchful because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. So he, he extends this image of shepherd and says, Satan is prowling around God's people like a roaring lion. And you're a, he says, the first thing is you are to guard and protect. You're a sheepdog. And when the lion, the bear, uh, the wolf, whatever metaphor comes along, your job is to actually protect the people. And so Christian theologians have talked about it in a couple of ways. They've said that the job of the elder is first to guard or protect the deposit of the apostles which is the gospel itself. And so the first way that they beat away the lion, the the tempter, is they protect the gospel. And so they're first to be actually theologians. They're to care about true teaching and false teaching. They're to protect the people because they protect the gospel. But then secondly, the other aspect of this is that they then use that gospel to protect the hearts of the people, the church, whenever they're being tempted. And so for every single one of us, if you're a Christian today, uh, the lion, the lion, the world, the flesh, and the devil comes into your life at different times and says, God is not what you thought. He's not good. Leave the faith. You know, if you were to leave the faith, you could be with any person you wanted to be with. If you were to leave the faith, you know, science and faith just don't, ultimately they're not compatible in the end. The lion, the wolf, the bear comes into your life, into your heart, through all manner of temptation, and tries to get you to walk away over and over and over and over again. And God says, I'm sending out the sheepdogs to try to guard and protect you with what they're guarding, which is the gospel itself, the gospel message itself. Now, that's the negative side. Then there's a positive side, and we'll move on. And the positive side, uh, the positive side is this, that Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. He takes me out of the valley of death and leads me to still waters by green grass, beautiful pastures. You see the positive side? The positive side of the under shepherd is to then say, I protect you and then I take you to the green grass. And the green grass is just Jesus. To say, don't follow me, I'm just trying to help you find the green grass again. Every time you're tempted to say, I'm not sure science and faith are compatible. I'm not sure that God is actually good. I'm not sure I can get through this. How could evil exist and God be good at the same time? The under shepherd, the sheepdog says, let me show you the green grass again. Let me take you back to the truth over and over and over again. Now, we've got to move on to the last thing. But let me, let me close this second revolutionary call by saying this. Remember, the elder is an example Meaning that this is actually just everybody's job. He's, he's just a leader among equals, all called to the same exact thing. All of us are called to come alongside as sheepdogs to each other, to one another, in mutual love and say, let me take you back to the green grass. To come alongside a friend, a Christian friend in the congregation and say, I see that you're, you're, you're walking away. You're, you're chasing after these things. This is not going to fulfill you. This is not it. You think it's it, but this is not it. Let me take you back to the green grass. That's the elder's job as a leader among equals, but it's everybody's ministry. 
Elder is called to the same exact thing that everybody else is, but as, as a leader, as a model in the midst of that ministry. And that means that an elder, like everybody else, is a sinner, a, a helpless sheep, in desperate need of spiritual power so that they don't walk away from the green grass themselves. And that, that leaves us with a question. And the, the biggest question of the passage might be this. Where do you find the spiritual power to be an elder, elders? Well, the answer is the exact same thing. Where, where do you find the power to even be a sheep at all? And you remember Psalm 23, the great Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. That God is the good shepherd of the sheep. And then you come to the Gospels. And Jesus in John chapter 10 stands up in the midst of the apostles and says, I am the good shepherd. I, I am the God of Psalm 23. And we, we learn immediately that the good shepherd, the shepherd of the sheep of the Old Testament came into history and took on flesh. And he's standing right there. The Lord has become the good shepherd in this human, Jesus Christ. And there, we're, he's so close. But that, that, not even that is the end of the story of spiritual power. Where does it really come from? And it, it's this, that in the beginning of the gospel, when Jesus first showed up in John chapter 1, John the Baptist opened his mouth the first time he saw Jesus, the good shepherd, and said what? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see, the power to be an elder is the same as the power to be a Christian. And it's to see that the good shepherd came into history, but he didn't stay the shepherd. He became the lamb. He became the sheep. The sheep are helpless. The sheep are spiritually dumb. Jesus Christ came to become the lamb. In other words, you see what he's saying? He's saying that he took on everything that we are. He took on what's wrong with us. The, the spiritual power an elder needs to be a good elder is the same a Christian needs to be a Christian, and that's to see that Jesus Christ was the lamb for you that went to the slaughter. That's how Isaiah puts it, and it's quite crude, but it's true. That that's the heart of spiritual power. It's nothing but saying, oh boy, in his, in, when Jesus was slaughtered as the, as the lamb of God, there's my power. Grace was poured upon me. That's the green grass. It's him. It's what he did for me. It's what he came to do for me. And that's the real secret to all of this. That's the revolutionary call that Jesus changed leadership forever. That it became all about the cross. It became all about him. And that means that elders aren't sinless, uh, not even close. Instead, what we might say is elders are meant to be true Christians. And what's a true Christian? A true Christian is a person who knows how desperately they need the grace of the Lamb of God. Now, let me close finally uh, with the third revolutionary call, and very briefly. And in light of all that, this is how Peter wraps it up. He says in verse 5, uh, likewise, you who are younger, which is not just young in age, but you who are not an elder. So anybody that's not a leader, uh, be subject to the elders. And then he says this, clothe yourself with humility, all of you, toward one another. Now, P Peter ends it, in the modern world, in, the 20, in 2023, you, you might not catch it, but in the first century, he ends it with something that's truly revolutionary. He turns to the people that are under the leadership of the elders and says, yes, you're subject to the elders' authority. And he says, but to all of you, elders and people, be subject to one another in humility. Uh, the world had never seen anything like that before when Peter writes, writes this right here. Re remember that in the first century, even in the midst of uh, Judaism, in the midst of the synagogues and the Jewish leadership of the towns, uh, elders had, had nearly absolute right over the people. They owned the buildings. They ran the educational system. They were in charge of the health care. They were paid very well. Uh, they, they gathered the temple tax, all of this. And Peter's coming and saying, not anymore. Not after Jesus it's got to change. And he says, here's the revolution. Actually, all of you are just in mutual subjection to one another. That you're just, you're, you're commonly and equally humble before one another. That, that's the revolution. Now, let me give you two, two ways that this works out, and we'll finish. Um, the first is in 1 Timothy 5. So Paul says the same thing in 1 Timothy 5. And there he says that 
he says this, that the role of elder sometimes is to come alongside somebody and tell them that they're really concerned for them, that this is the path of discipleship. An elder sometimes does in the church need to come to church members and say, I'm worried about where you're going. I'm worried about something you're believing. I'm worried about a pattern of your life, a direction that you've been heading. I'm worried that you may be walking away from Jesus. And that's not spiritual abuse, not at all, not when it's done in love. That's, that's actually the call, the call not only of the elder, but of all of us to each other. Sometimes that happens, but 1 Timothy 5, verse 17, Paul does something. He says, and the elders are to be subject to the people, and therefore, if anybody has a complaint, has a concern, all they have to do is gather one other person and come and speak and say to the elder, I'm worried about where you're going. I'm worried about you walking away from Jesus. I'm worried about the path of life you've been living. I'm worried about something you've been teaching. And that had never happened before. You see, he's saying it it actually now goes both directions. That elders are chosen to shepherd and model and and lead people back to the green grass, but sometimes the people are also called to lead the the elder back to the green grass. And that it works in both directions. It's mutual. It's it's mutual humility, he says. Now, the second thing, and here's the the important bit, um, that, that means that he's calling on the church to be a space, a culture of mutual love in every direction. He says, so be humble, all of you, before one another. Elders, deacons, women pastoral, women's pastoral team, uh, members, regular attenders, visitors. He says it's comprehensive. Everybody just be mutually humble, subjecting yourself to each other in every single direction, whatever the relationship might go, however it might be. It doesn't matter in every direction. And, and that means he's saying never allow for a culture of hypercriticism, Never allow for a culture of abuse, spiritual abuse. None of that. In every direction, instead, the paradigm is this. Character, humility, truth, and love. So keep short accounts. Understand that there's always going to be, we're always going to struggle with one another to some degree. But keep a short account because the paradigm is humility, character, love. It's a culture, ultimately, of trust in every single direction, uh, remembering, remembering that we all, we all actually share, just share the same ministry. And the ministry is, is nothing but this, helping one another to get to the end of our days believing in Jesus Christ. That's the mutual ministry, and it's as simple as that. Um, I'll close with this. One pastor uh, was, was talking about this mutual humility idea that we see in Peter, and he says, what does this look like? In other words, he asked the question, uh, where, where should you look for an elder in your church, according to 1 Peter 5, verse 5. And this is what he says. He says, on the one hand, they're guarding the deposit of the faith. You know, on the one hand, they're over here, they're reading John Calvin. They're reading people named Bob Inc. You know, they're, they're, they're reading theology. They're, they're loving the Bible. They're getting into the Word. They're trying to understand more and more of what's been given to us through the apostles all the time. That's the one hand. On the other hand, they're taking out the trash, they're in the crash. They're in kids' church. They're cleaning up after the service. They're praying with the sick. They're sitting at the hospital bed. They're holding the hand of the dying. They're playing with the children. It's both and. That's mutual humility. That in every direction, love. In every direction, humility. And so the universal call is simply this. Our church, St. Columbus, will always, will always, by the Spirit, grow and grow and grow in health spiritual health, insofar as in every single direction, no matter what role anybody plays in the church, we are putting on the clothing that Peter says here, the clothing of humility towards one another, Uh, the clothing that the great shepherd of the sheep put on when he became the lamb, that that's the model for healthy church. Let's pray together. Father, we ask Lord, that you would uh, gift us all with humility and with love and with trust. And we ask for that um, because, Lord, we, want, we long to be guided by the Holy Spirit in the way that we shepherd one another towards the finish line. So, Lord, you say that the reward is not in this life, uh, verse 4, that, but it's an un- unfading crown of glory that is yet to come. And so, 
Help us today, um, especially as leaders, for me, for all of us who are leaders, Lord, I pray for them and lift them before you and ask this morning that they would be renewed in the call, the call to uh, not love anything but helping people find the green grass. Uh, Jesus, that's you. We know that's you. And so we pray, Lord, um, that you would give us grace, help us to forgive one another as we, of course, fall short of this, and give us great wisdom as we seek uh, new elders in this coming season. And we pray for this in Christ's name. Amen.